So I guess we should get started. Uh, first, let me introduce myself. My name is Chan Gi. I'm the director for the uh, Lloyd's Register Foundation Institute for the Public Understanding of uh, Risk. And we have this uh, sort of regular seminar. You know, uh, sometimes it's open to the uh, NUS, uh, even uh, outsiders, but most of the times uh, it's confined to ourselves. So today, this seminar is mainly for the uh, researchers and staff in the, uh, our institute. Uh, we are very uh, pleased to have uh, Professor Shoemaker, she's here, and her um, uh, senior research fellow, uh, Chen Yuan Yuan. I hope you're, I pronounced her name correctly. Uh, yeah, to give us a seminar. Um, and she's going to, uh, okay, let me briefly introduce her about uh, Yuan Yuan. Right, she has a PhD in uh, hydrology and water resources, and she spent some time in the uh, Department of uh, Energy National Lab in the US uh, for developing the land and atmospheric aspect of the climate models. Uh, and we are interested in this, uh, you know, from the this uh, risk uh, understanding and the communication point of view, uh, because there are always um, uncertainties in this kind of prediction, right, in terms of the climate modeling uh, and this kind of uh, uncertainty can actually cause problems when people start to question you know, how uh, the validity of the prediction uh, that's how the uh, climate change uh, deniers and skeptics manage to uh, you know, provoke an, a debate about uncertainty of climate modeling and therefore uh, right, start to erode the uh, public trust in climate science so from that angle we will be uh, you know, uh, very interested to find out right, how uncertainty is accounted for, and and uh, and how. And I think uh, in uh, Yunyan's talk, she will focus on mainly the uh, land model, right, uh, which is used in the climate change forecasting. So her presentation title is uh, "Reducing Forest uh, Forecast uh, Uncertainty of Ecosystem Changes in Climate Models by Analysis and Parallel Global." optimization for model parameter calibration is quite a mouthful, but yeah, yeah I think that reflects uh, 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 the focus of the talk. So without further ado, uh, let's uh, welcome uh, Yuan Yuan, and uh, yeah, I think she already put up the slide shows. Yeah, so Yuan Yuan, uh, uh, it's all yours. Okay, okay th thank you for, for, cool, for the introduction, really appreciate. And also thank you for the IPUR for this opportunity. So we can have the, to share our most recent research on the reducing the forecast uncertainty of predicting the ecosystem change in the earth system models. Uh, and I also would like to acknowledge my mentor and my co-author, Poof Christine Shoemaker. So, uh, Actually, I planned a very uh, brief self-introduction, but I think Poof Ku has already given a very comprehensive one. I just want to uh, emphasize a little bit, like previously my research was uh, worked on how to modeling the impact of the climate and the land use changes on the carbon and the water cycle dynamics using our earth system modeling approach. And uh, so with this, I will go into our presentation, presentation today. Uh, I think many of you possibly have heard about the global climate models. This kind of model, it had typically consists of three main components, the atmosphere model, the ocean model, and the land surface model to try to cover the entire Earth system. But the climate model is mainly developed to help us understand climate change related topics. So it mainly focused on the physics in the atmosphere and simplified the ocean and the land surface. But later on, the community realized actually these two components, they also play a very important role even in the climate change feedbacks. So the community is shift to developing the more advanced Earth system models. And these Earth system models, they have many additional components. For example, it has a marine ecosystem like in the ocean, and also it has a carbon cycle. So for example, it can simulate like the photosynthesis and the respiration of the plants. 
and also it can simulate the natural and the human activities, such as the land use and the land cover changes. So this more advanced Earth system models, they are more effective to help us stand to study the climate change, the impact of the human activities, and also the effectiveness of the current various climate mitigation strategies. But the Earth system model is very comprehensive and with so many Earth system components. So for this presentation today, I will mainly focus on the land surface model within the Earth system model. The reason like I particularly interest in the land surface model is because this land surface processes, they are very important in the climate impact uh, aspects. So for example, under this extreme events, like the heat waves, the wildfires, and the flooding, and this is even a flooding happening in Singapore, and also the droughts. It's all these land surface processes that are respond to these extreme events. And when we take a look at the evolution of the land surface models, so here the X axis is showing the time, so from the early 70s to the current date, and here each color it represents for one element in the land surface model. So we can see with time, more and more elements is adding to the land surface model because people are realizing the increasing importance of this land surface process. And when we take a further look and for this, all these elements, we can see particularly implementing the vegetation is the main focus during this model development process, such as the canopy, can, uh, the plant canopy, the dynamic vegetation, and the land cover change. So the reason like why vegetation got so much attention in the community is because they respond to the climate change and could further alter the climate through their interaction with the atmosphere. So here I will show you a very simple example to show like how vegetation will interact with the atmosphere and with the climate. So this is a very a piece of very healthy vegetation. So they will have a lot of evapotranspiration and they can offer us a very pleasant temperature. And when the maturity of this vegetation increase, then it will affect the water cycle. So the evapotranspiration will decrease and the temperature will increase. And then later, when the maturity of the vegetation increase more significantly, then it will affect the carbon cycle and the water cycle and even the climate more dramatically. So which is why this vegetation got so much attention in the development. But also in order to implement this vegetation into the models, it has different uh, development periods. So at the very beginning, so to implement the vegetation, we are, we are using a called big leaf model. So for this kind of model, it is using area average leaf layer vegetation for all the plants. So for the same vegetation, it will have the same height and the same size. But we know it's not true because in the real world, like even for the same tree species, it will have young tree and old tree, the small tree and the big trees. So this kind of big leaf models have its own limitations. So for example, it couldn't represent for the size and the age of the same vegetation. And the different vegetations, they are really actually in the real world, they are competing with each other. So they either survive together or they will exclude with each other. And this model also couldn't simulate this kind of processes. So it will, the simulation results will be very difficult to compare to the real world observations. And in order to overcome these limitations, uh, the community is starting to develop the secondary generation vegetation models, the so-called ecosystem demography model, also called ED model. So here we can see in the ED model with the same vegetation, 
it will have a different size and a different age. So it will have a canopy layer and the understory layer depend on their height. And the advantage of this is they can compete for light depends on their height. And also they can compete for the resources in the soil, such as the, the water and the nutrition. And besides like just modeling one vegetation, it can also simulate different kinds of vegetation. And if they, their competitions and their resulting, if they can coexist with each other or they are excluded with each other and also their mortality and also their new recruitment. And so, and so this uh, new ED models they have more complicated physical processes, which is more corresponding to what's happening in the real world. But at the same time, this more complex physical processes are also introducing new challenges. So they are more computational expensive. So I just give you a very simple example. So if we just simulate a very a single piece of vegetation, it may take like five hours to finish just one simulation. And so thereby, these ED models, they are very difficult to calibrate. So when, here, when I mean calibrate, is we adjust the values of the model parameters to match the observations. So this kind of calibration activity, it will, it will require lots of model simulations and the evaluations, which will take lots of computational times. And currently, there are some main approaches have been applied to calibrate this kind of complicated models, uh, such as the empirical tuning based on the expert knowledge, the sensitivity and the uncertainty quantification work. And also more recently uh, with advances in machine learning, also people are using the machine learning techniques to build up the inexpensive surrogate models. But all these approaches, they have their own limitations. So for example, the empirical tuning, they may fail to account for the joint parameter variabilities. And also for the machine learning techniques, if they are building up the relationship just based on the model input and the model output and treated the model as a black box. So they couldn't consider the physical structures inside the model. And uh, so they may feel when it applied to other out of distribution data set. And uh, so up to this point, so I'm talking about like the advances in the new ED vegetation model, and it's still difficult to calibrate this model. So for the vegetation, so the tropical forest is the main portion of the Earth's vegetation. And here is a, a picture I took when I paid a visit to BCI Panama to do a field work. So this BCI site is a primary tropical site. And the reason like, we are particularly interested in the tropical forest is because like, even though the tropical forest cover a very small, only 7% of the Earth's surface, but they cycle more carbon, water, and energy than any other buyer. They are the world's, world's the most important land-based carbon sinks. It helps to regulate the Earth's climate, and currently they are very important part of the nature-based climate solutions. And we are located in the Southeast Asia. So this region is home to nearly like 15 to 20 percent of the world's tropical forest areas. And in Singapore, so there are also significant ongoing efforts are devoted for the forest plantation, such as the One Million Trees Movement and the Green Plan 2030. But at the same time, this tropical forest they have undergone substantial land use and land cover changes. For example, due to the wildfires, actually this is a figure uh, for the wildfire in Indonesia. And also due to human activities, such as the uh, log in and also the crop expansion and the oil palm and the rubber uh, plantations. 
So, and here it is a figure showing the deforestation situation in Southeast Asia to, uh, between two decades. Here, the green color means the coverage for the tropical forest. So when we compare these two figures, we can see lots of forest has disappeared in the Southeast Asia. So this make it very uncertain and debatable whether currently the tropical forest is still a net carbon sink or actually it has become a net carbon source under all this kind of global changes. And also the earth system models, like I just mentioned earlier, they are very effective tools to help us understand these global changes. But the tropical forest is very poorly represented in the model. So it will result in very large uncertainty in the future projections and also for us to have us understand all these processes. So it's very important for us to improve the prediction for the tropical forest in the earth system <coughs> models. And when I mentioned the poorly representation of the tropical forest in the earth system <coughs> models, so here I would like to give you a example on tropical forest the composition, their representation in the earth system model. So <coughs> the tropical forest, they have the greatest tree species diversity. So for example, the early and the late successional plants, they are the typical tree species in the tropical forest. So here I show two figures with the early and the late successional plants. And these two species, they have very distinguished characteristics, including from their wood density and their leaf and the root lifetimes, their mortality rates, and also their root profiles. And also they have a different tolerance to, for light. For example, the early successional plant, they are very light demanding, but the late plant, they, are, they can tolerate for the shades. And this early and late plants in the real world, they are grow together. So they, there is a coexistence for these two species in the real world the tropical forest. But currently in the advanced ED models, it doesn't have sufficient parameterization for this kind of coexistence for this typical tropical tree species. And this will have some uh, outcomes. So for example, this insufficient representation of this composition for tropical forests have been reported to alter the model of vegetation biomass by two times compared to the observations. So it's very important for us to improve this representation of the tropical forest composition in the model. And up to uh, this point, so I'm mainly talking about the carbon, like the related to all these vegetations, but actually carbon and hydrology, they are linked in the tropical forest ecosystems. There is no way to separate to consider carbon and hydrology. This is because like the hydrological parameters, they control such processes like the infiltration, the so water holding capacity, the runoff generation, and the recharge to the groundwater. And eventually, it can determine how much water is available for the plant to uptake. So all these hydrological processes, they will eventually affect the growth and the structure and the functioning of the forest. And also, as I just mentioned earlier, the typical tree species, like the early successional plants and the late successional plants, they are coexist with each other, but they have very different routing profiles. So they have different availability to assess the soil water and the groundwater. And this is the hydrological properties which are determining the distribution of this soil water and the groundwater below ground. And eventually it will control the coexistence of a tropical forest ecosystem. And another example to show the impact of the hydrology is from a benchmark study for an ED model that I published earlier. So this is the benchmark results 
for the upper panel is for the latent heat and the lower panel is for the sensible heat. So this latent heat and the sensible heat, they are energy budget terms. And we, the reason we are concerning about the simulation for this energy budget is because they affect the water cycle and eventually they will feed back to the climate. So when we see the results here, here the blue color is for the observation and the green color is from the benchmark with more than 500 simulation results. So we can see it has a systematic bias for simulating this energy budget with a lower latent heat and a higher sensible heat. And we have found like the reason for this is because we have insufficient calibration of hydrological parameters because this energy budget is not only controlled by the vegetation growth, it also being controlled by the soil processes. And so up to here, I would like to uh, summarize all these research gaps I have just mentioned. So we have advanced ED vegetation models, which can simulate more physical processes in the tropical forest. But these ED models, they are very computational expensive and the existing calibration approaches have their insufficiency, such as without the consideration of the joint parameter variation and the physical structures of the model. So they will either reduce the for for forecast accuracy or fail to apply to other data set. And also there has been inadequate representation for both the tropical forest the composition and the impact of the hydrology. So the objective of this study is we try to develop a computational efficient calibration framework based on the physical model structures to reduce uncertainty in forecasting the terrestrial ecosystem changes in the earth system models. So to achieve this objective, we are applying the parallel surrogate global optimization schemes developed in our group. So two of Christine Schumacher's group have worked on decades to develop all these advanced optimization algorithms. For example, the parallel here, I mean, is we try to take advantage of the advances in computational power to using many processing units at the same time so we can save the computation the human time to find the solution and we have very uh, very good optimization algorithms such as the pots and the goats they can find the answer very quickly and very efficient and here so i won't go into details for this optimization algorithms but they are all have been published and validated in the literature and so this study we are concerning about the ED model and the particular one I'm using here is called the CLN5, which is the land surface model for the community assist model CSM. Here it is a figure from the CLN5 technical note showing the processes that are simulated by the model. So we can see CLN5 can simulate many land surface processes, including the carbon cycle, the hydrology, the surface energy budget, and also the ecosystem dynamics. And also CLN5 has an ED module uh, to simulate the vegetation vegetation part. And for myself, I'm also an official contributing author to CLN5 because of my contribution uh, to help implement perennial bioenergy crops into the model. For, for this study, we are calibrate this CM5 model. And so also, when I mean uh, calibrate, it means like we adjust the values of the model parameters to match the uh, real world of the observations. And here we select 19 sensitive parameters. We calibrate both the vegetation parameter and the hydrological parameters to better represent the role of hydrology, as I just mentioned earlier, which didn't get in uh, sufficient attention in earlier studies. And also we calibrate both the early and the late sectional tropical forest so we can better represent the tropical forest composition 
And so we adjust the values of these parameters to match the observation by using the optimization schemes developed in our group. And for the observation, uh, they are collected at the BCI Panama, which is a primary tropical forest. And the, the last six variables have been collected. Uh, they are all corresponding to the growth of the vegetation and also the water cycle, including like the tree size distribution. It means uh, as how many trees is following in a certain size group and also the plant productivity and the energy budget and the soil water. And these variables, they are collected by a flux tower that has been installed in Panama. And we also validate against the runoff in the streams. And so here it is myself doing the field work in Panama to collect the stream flow data uh, out there. So you can see I'm just in very shining color because I've been told like it's easier to be identified in the tropical jungle. And uh, so here, uh, before I show you our results, I would like to uh, draw you back the uh, memory, coil back your memory for the vegetation models I have mentioned earlier, the big leaf model and the ED model. So the ED model is what we use here, which is more advanced. So we can simulate the different size of the different species. So here it is the results with the, the X axis is for the tree diameter and the Y axis is for the, the tree number density. And this is for a previously more simulation results. Here this blue color is the observation and the green color is more than 500 simulation results. So we can see these previous results, they have considerable threat and a significant bias. And this is our modeling results. So here the blue color is the observation again, and the red color is our optimization results. So we can see our work improves the simulation of this tropical forest composition by capturing like the different size of tropical forest corresponding to their density. And also we would like to see the efficiency of our algorithm. So here this graph shows here the x-axis is the number of model evaluations. So we are using 192 in total. And the, the uh, initial 24 simulations is used as initial conditions. So I didn't include it here. And the y-axis is the adult term between the model simulation and the, the observation. So the lower the arrow term, the better. So when we take a look at this graph, we can see overall our optimization algorithm, it conserves very quickly. And we can find the optimal solution within a very reasonable computing budget. So here is 192 model simulations in total. And so here, this black line is we only calibrate the vegetation parameters. And this red line is we calibrate both the vegetation and the hydrology parameters. So here, the lower the value, the better. So we can see when we jointly calibrate both the vegetation and the hydrology parameters, it significantly improves the model performance, which further demonstrates the impact of hydrology on the model simulation results. And also, uh, as I mentioned earlier, this energy budget, it affects the water cycle and will feed back to the climate. So here is the fitness of the model to the observed energy budget with sensible heat in the left and the latent heat in the right. So here, the blue color is the observation and the black color is we only calibrate the vegetation parameters. So we can see also corresponding to the systematic bias I mentioned earlier, it also if we only calibrate vegetation parameters, it will result in a higher sensible heat and a lower latent heat. And this is the result when we calibrate both the vegetation and the hydrology parameters. So we can see with the additional calibration of the hydrological parameters, it also improves the simulation for the energy budget. 
And uh, so this work, we improve the total energy budget in the tropical forest by getting the best hydrological and the vegetation parameters. This also has very important implications because this energy budget, they are the boundary conditions in the land surface to the climate. So our results can help us to better, to act more accurately, simulate the land and the atmosphere interactions. And also earlier, I mentioned like our work improves the simulation of the tropical forest the dynamics, for example, their composition. And this also has very important implications. So here, I would like to bring back your memory for a figure I showed at the very beginning to see how the increased vegetation maturity will affect the carbon and the water cycle and feedback to the climate. So without a very accurate calibrate simulation of the tropical forest, it's very difficult to capture these changes and even for the future forecast. So our work can re help reduce the uncertainty in predicting the changes in the tropical forest and how they will affect the future assistance dynamics. And also uh, we have some possible future applications so our next study is to try to study, investigate the impact of the deforestation and the reforestation caused by the selective log-in on hydrological and the carbon cycle dynamics in the tropical forest under the global changes. And also we can calibrate an even greater number of tree species in addition to the early and the late successional tropical forests to help us understand the role of forest diversity. And this also has very important implications for forest management. And also this calibration work we developed here is very flexible and it's easy to attend to many other tropical sites, for example, in Puerto Rico, in Amazon, and also here in Southeast Asia, where many sites have been installed or this uh, necessary equipment to collect the data. So we can also extend this to all these tropical sites to even understand uh, like the tropical forest in different tropical environments. And uh, with this, I would like to come to the conclusions. So we, uh, we say that Earth system models, they are very important to predict the climate change and understand its impacts. And uh, the vegetation part, the ecosystem demography model is the particular new focus in the Earth system model development because it can simulate more realistic physical processes, but at the same time, they are very difficult to calibrate. So in this study, we developed a calibration framework using the Pario surrogate global optimization techniques to calibrate this kind of computational expensive ED models. And we have shown our, our optimization algorithm is very efficient and effective. So the computational difficulties associated with calibrating such expensive ED models can be greatly reduced. And also our simulation results improves the simulation for the total energy budget and the tropical forest dynamics. This kind of result can help to reduce uncertainty in predicting the land atmosphere interactions and also how changes in the tropical forest will affect the future assistant dynamics. And also this framework is very flexible and can be applied and extend for many other aspects of studies and the climate change. And uh, in the end, uh, I also would like to draw your attention for the global optimization codes that have been developed in our group. So for uh, this, our stu this study, I'm using an uh, algorithm called POTS. This paper has published in the environmental modeling and the software this year. And uh, besides POTS, our group also has many other codes for optimization, such as the multi-objective, the mixed integer, the multi-fidelity, and the machine learning applications. All the code is in Python. So if anyone you are interested, please feel free to contact Proof Christine Schumacher and she will give you the instructions and the guidance. 
And also we have a GitHub website called PySort, which has lots of downloads. From there, you can even apply to create your own surrogate global optimization algorithm, which is pretty cool. And with this, I would like to uh, thank you for your time and attention. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Yin Yuan. Thank you very much for a very enlightening uh, presentation uh, uh, on the very important topic for climate change modeling, uh, specifically on the uh, land vegetation. Uh, what's it, how do you how do you account for the effect of land vegetation? Yeah, at least the first time I hear this kind of modeling. Uh, I have a few questions, but maybe I let the others ask first. You know, if, if any um, anybody wants to start. Um, Prof, actually, there are questions in the chat box that you can. Oh, okay. Yeah, let me see. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Hang on. Eh? Yeah. It's really tapping my eyesight. The chat box is always very small. Okay. Um. All right. Uh, so let me start from the uh, question from uh, Shi Hui. Yeah. So. I'm not sure Yang can can see see the chat, right? So can oh, you? Yes, I can. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Can your ED? Let me. I just read it out. Uh, can your ED uh, climatic forecasting models and the their associated experimental parameters and stochastically factor variables in terms of hydrological dynamics, weather cycles, and the measurements of vegetation growth responses to this experimentally modified changes be Tested and simulated on a small scale. Yeah, that's also one of the questions I have. Within a self enclosed ecosystem such as greenhouses, or do they require real world large scale ecological setting to accomplish uh, this task? Just to add, I have this uh, question in mind also because you look at one island, right? Or we look at Singapore, right? So, uh, what is the scale that you, minimum scale you know, for, uh, for this kind of study? But okay, this, this uh, question is very technical. Uh, Maybe you just take a look and then a response to it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Th thank you for the question. Actually, for this ED model, the skill is very flexible. So we can either just study a single piece of forest or we can apply to a large like a regional or global skills but the skill you just mentioned here like for uh, like a greenhouses and they are yeah it's quite feasible it's very feasible yeah this because it's the land surface model so it focuses on the various res resolutions and the skills in the land surface so yeah it's very uh, very feasible the answer is yes uh, but if the scale is too small, and I was imagine like, I just model, let's say, let's say NUS. Mm -hmm. right? I yeah, I, I know, I know. So that's why here, like I give an example for oh. like they are computational expensive. So it will take like uh, just if we hear this five hours for one simulation is just for one piece of forest. Because it has many detailed uh, simulation uh, processes such as their photosynthesis and their respiration and the different species they will compete for these resources in the soil and uh, the, such as the water nutrition. So it's also very minor scale processes already included in this ED models. Okay, maybe yeah. I, I hope yeah, yeah. answer. Yeah, uh, maybe I move on to the next questions. Uh, no, raised by Justin. Yeah. So thank you for your very well articulated presentation. There's limited knowledge of the performance of ED models in dry lands, partly due to the uh, uh, character characterizing the uh, heterogeneity of the vegetation and hydrometeorological conditions. Do you have any thoughts on how ED models can help facilitate improved understanding of gross primary productivity as one of the important components of the carbon cycle? Uh, yeah, actually we validate against the, the gross, the GPP, the gross primary productivity. So this is uh, uh, this 
component that I mentioned here, the, this flux tower and mentioned that this uh, measure this plant productivity. And we also have validate against uh, this variable. Just uh, due to the time limitation, I didn't show the results for the GPP here. But yeah, yes, we have already validated against this variable. Uh, yeah, this variable Justin just mentioned the GPP. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. The next question is from our colleague Olivia, who is a lead scientist in our Institute for the Environment and Climate uh, uh, area. Uh -huh. Right. Okay. Uh, thanks for a very clear and interesting presentation. Has the work been integrated into the IPCC? Six assessment reports, and you mentioned the systematic bias of previous models. Can you extrapolate from that to say something about whether there has been systematic bias in assessments of the carbon sink source role of tropical forests? Yeah, that's a very good question. So yeah, I know. So for this carbon sink or source question, it's very. It's highly debatable and uncertain in the literature. So over the past two, two decades, many papers are, are de debating actually on this, especially over the Amazon regions. And uh, under this, uh, this current global changes, because this climate change and the deforestation that was happening, which makes the carbon sink and the source, this question is even more difficult to answer. Uh, and uh, this, our results haven't been integrated in the IPCC assessment yet, but and uh, and I also uh, like even for the big leaf models from the early earlier generation, they are still useful models to uh, they offer off, offer some insights for us. It's just and later on we have more understanding and the more computational powers. So we have this more complicated models to help us better understand and quantify and. Uh, so as for if I can comment on whether it's a tropical sink or source, and I think it will need to need more assessment on that so we can have a more, more quantified answer for that. But I think our results can help us to improve the simulation and give like offer a better, better results. Yeah, th thank you. Yeah, Olivia, okay with that? <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, there's a yeah. Okay. There's a question from uh, Zi Yu uh, regarding your methodology. Could you clarify whether the model calibration you are performing involves trying to fit optimal parameters to a given unknown uh, mathematical model? or trying to find a surrogate black box model to the true ED model? That's one of the questions I have too. Yeah. Is it a surrogate? Oh, no, actually we are calibrating. Right. Uh, actually, yeah, I know people will, uh, because he, when I mentioned the proof with the techniques to here, we are building up like the surrogate models. So using machine learning, this is building up the surrogate model for the model itself, but for our algorithm, we are we also call the parallel surrogate uh, global optimization. Here, the surrogate we are not building up the surrogate model for the model itself, and the, you then use the the surrogate. Actually, we are like constructing the uh, surrogate at each iteration and each evaluation, but we are also compare it to the the real model so we are calibrating the true ed model and the, so we are not build up a black box model we are calibrated the true ed model and with this i think for possibly proof christine shoemaker will have more do you have anything to add on to this uh is proof still here? can you hear me Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I would agree with what you exactly with what you said. Um, so, 
our optimization is trying to find the best parameters for the true model, for the true ED model, and but mm -hmm. which has parameters which are uncertain. That's our goal. In the process, we do build a surrogate, but it's not, um, we're, we're not trying to do what would regard as a surrogate black box model to the true ED model. Where it was actually the, focusing very specifically on the parameters, thereby hoping to preserve as much as possible the science that's embedded in, the, in that model in terms of how things interact with each other. I'm done. <laughs> So essentially, you have a, a physics or, or science-based model, right? Yeah, uh, yes, yeah. Yes. So then you're trying to find the optimal parameters to give the best result. But in the process of doing so, you do employ surrogate uh, you know, surface and, and uh, some kind of fitting to, to reduce the number of simulations required, I suppose, right? But it still uh, um, links to link to the uh, actual uh, physical model. Right? Is, is, is it correct to say that? Uh, it, the surrogate process is still needed you know, to reduce the number of simulations. Uh, yes, yes, yeah, yeah, because it's, yeah, yeah, it reduces like the simulation mm. evaluations that we need to yeah. do for the real, mo real model. Yeah, yeah. But as it is, yeah, we are still calibrating the, the, of the, the, the parameters, parameters for the yeah. real model. Yes. Yeah, okay, yeah. And on this side, you mentioned also the use of GPU, right? So, so you use GPU. Uh, 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 this model, this model, we're using the CPU, uh, oh, no, the no, CPU, CPU mode. Okay. okay. Yeah, but this algorithm, algorithm is can apply to GPU, but our model for this particular application, we are using CPU. I see, I see. So is there any mm -hmm. attempt to also try GPU? Because you know, each board can contain uh, thousands of uh, processors and it's relatively mm -hmm. cheap, no? Yeah, you know. Yeah, I tried it before, uh, right? Each box can be like eight thousand, and, and two box mm -hmm. will give you sixteen thousand processes at the same time uh, to, to run the simulation. But of course, the computation has to be highly parallelized uh, to take advantage of the high number of processes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and uh, so for the yeah for the GPU, but the for the ED model is not built up upon the GPU node. That's mm -hmm. why we are using CPU node. But our algorithm is applicable to the GPU node, and we do have like group mates. They are applying to take advantage of the GPU nodes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, okay. So, okay, there's a question from my colleague, uh, Sertong. Oh, Sertong is here. Okay, so this seminar is open to not just our institute. Huh? Okay, I just realized uh, it's more than 30 participants. So Sertong asked a question in your slide 19, or the, which mm -hmm. is shown here. Would you would your objective function get more and more negative? Yeah, yeah, it, yeah your zero and then the scale, I also noticed that it's minus two. Uh, your vertical scale, <laughs> below two more scale, but below is minus two. Oh hmm? uh, yes, it's minus two. I just uh, I see, uh, yeah. It's minus two, right? So, mm -hmm. so yeah, yeah. Would it continue to uh, go, <laughs> go to more negative? Uh, no, that, that, I wonder that too. Yeah. <laughs> so actually, you, you I to tested. Go get to zero, right? But rather than uh, go to more negative values. Oh, actually, this is the arrow turn from the uh between the six variables I calibrate. So so I sum up them together to include the in this arrow term yeah and uh, actually this model and even at this point with 192 simulations it already find like the the optimal solution we are interested in and i also have tested a case like with uh, almost 400 evaluations and the algorithm does can continue like to uh the, yeah, get a lower and but not that much. And also, so finally we pick up like this 192 simulations to consider both like the computational time and also a reasonable uh, solution we can have. So given like even with 192 evaluations, we already have a very satisfied uh, so solutions. And yeah, but with more and more simulations, it will take more and more computational time. So this is just like a compromise between all these objectives.
Yeah, okay. I actually, uh, so long as a follow up question, uh, which I also have uh, wanted to say, yeah, would, would, would not the sum of absolute error be better measure or for that matter, room mean square and you know, error? So that you don't have this problem oh. with negative oh. like, people start to question. Uh, uh, yeah. I, actually, uh, I call it arrow here just for the audience to better understand uh, what this term means. Actually, this real, uh, this real statistics is called Nash's efficient efficiency, called NSE. It's similar to the root mean square arrow to uh -huh. quantify the model performance. I just like use the arrow term so for the audience can better understand what I mean here. So I didn't specifically refer to the statistics, the name of the statistics. Yeah. But if it's the root mean square kind of error or absolute, then it shouldn't be negative, right? Um, okay, this right. Uh, no, it, it's called the Nash. Uh, Nash is uh, the N N S E, and N it's a negative oh. negative N S E. Yeah. Negative N S E. Yeah, N S E is the one is the perfect. So and so we use. But the optimization is trying to find the lowest value. So we use negative NSE to quantify the arrow terms. Okay, let me see. Is there any more question? Okay, looks like there's more question from the chat box. Uh, anybody who wants to just talk it out? No, uh, you can always uh, unmute yourself and ask question or raise your hand if you wish to. Can you hear me? Can anybody hear me? Yes, yes. Oh, yes. Okay, it's Shoemaker. Okay. So yeah. yes, we sh uh, that's really my fault. I'm probably the one who put the error on that on that slide. Um, it's a, there's different many different goodness of fit measures that you can use. Yeah. Um, and this was a, a goodness of fit measure and the idea was that um, the, the 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 smaller the error is, the smaller the the measure is, which is a good thing. But it happens to be uh, a measure it's very widely used in, in hydrology, uh, but it happens not to just be always a positive number. So just leave it at that, I guess. So these are, and that, the fact that we got such low numbers were was a very, very good fit. Mm. Okay. Is there any more question? So if, if not, uh, yeah, let's, uh, uh, I don't know how to clap, but uh, thank Yun Yen uh, for the wonderful presentation and uh, for this very interesting uh, topic that uh, you know, I think many of us uh, have not been aware of, right, the importance of uh, modeling vegetation and hydrology and uh, in the climate change modeling. Yeah, thank you so much. Okay, and thanks uh, thank you. to everybody for participating in this uh, seminar. I hope to see you in another seminar of uh, IPUR. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Prof. You. Shoemaker. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.